In our earlier video, we talked about what happened to King Air November 30 Hotel Golf in terms of what we can see the flight path, the sudden dive, the radio transmissions, and the questions raised by unsecured cargo. Today I want to slow things down and look at something much more specific. Not the cargo, not the weather, not speculation about the pilot. I want to look closely at the trim system on this particular airplane because this King Air is not trimmed like most King Airs. And once you understand how this system actually works, a few details in the preliminary report start lining up in a way that's difficult to ignore. Before we talk about failures, we have to understand what normal looks like. And on the King Air B100, normal is already a little different from what many pilots expect. Most airplanes trim pitch by moving a small trim tab on the elevator. You change the aerodynamic load on the elevator, the control forces relax, and the airplane holds a new attitude. Simple, familiar, and forgiving. If something goes wrong, you still have the elevator and you can usually muscle through it. The King Air B100 doesn't work that way. On this airplane, pitch trim is achieved by moving the entire horizontal stabilizer. When you command trim, you're not fine-tuning elevator balance, you're changing the airplane's fundamental pitch geometry. That's a much more powerful system, and when it behaves correctly, it works very well. When it doesn't, the consequences happen fast. There's another difference that really matters here. On most King Airs and most airplanes in general, there's a manual trim wheel somewhere in the cockpit. If the electric trim does something you don't like, you can physically crank against it. You have a mechanical backup. The B100 does not have that. There is no manual trim wheel. Pitch trim authority is entirely electrical. That alone doesn't make the airplane unsafe, but it does mean the pilot is relying on procedures and timing rather than raw mechanical leverage if something goes wrong. Now let's layer one more detail on top of that, the way runaway trim is stopped on this aircraft. On most airplanes, if trim runs away, you hit the disconnect once. The system shuts off and it stays off until you reset it. That's probably what a lot of pilots expect instinctively. On the B100, that's not how it works. There's a trim release button, but it must be pressed and held. The moment you release it, the trim can begin moving again. That means stopping an uncommanded trim event isn't a single decisive action, it's a sequence. And that sequence has to happen quickly. Why does that matter here? Because the aircraft didn't gradually lose control. It didn't wander off altitude over minutes. It went from stable flight into a steep accelerating descent in seconds. That's not how most loading issues present themselves, but it is how a powerful trim system can behave when it gets away from you. Let's walk through what an uncommanded nose-down trim scenario actually looks like in this airplane because it's very different from how many people picture it. At first, it might be subtle. The pilot feels increasing forward pressure in the yoke. Nothing dramatic yet. Airspeed starts creeping up. Vertical speed begins to oscillate because the pilot is correcting manually while the trim system keeps pushing back. Does that sound familiar? In this accident, ADS-B data shows vertical speed variations during the climb not wild but noticeable. The airplane wasn't settled. It was being actively flown. As trim continues to move, control forces rise quickly. Aerodynamic loads build with airspeed and now the pilot is no longer just flying the airplane, he's physically fighting it. This is where timing matters. The checklist for unscheduled pitch trim on the B-100 is not long, but it is memory-based for a reason. There isn't time to dig through a book while the airplane accelerates. You're expected to counter trim using the yoke switches, hold the trim release button continuously, and then reach down to the pedestal to shut off the primary trim circuit. All of this is happening while maintaining attitude with the elevator. And all of this is happening while control forces are climbing toward levels that can exceed 70 pounds. Now imagine that scenario just after takeoff. The airplane is heavy with fuel. It's climbing through a few thousand feet. Airspeed is increasing. There's little margin between manageable and overwhelming. If the trim continues nose down even briefly while the airplane accelerates, the situation can escalate rapidly. Once the nose drops and airspeed increases, the trim's aerodynamic authority increases too. That's a vicious feedback loop. This begins to explain some of the puzzle pieces. We have a rapid acceleration. We have a steep descent. We have heavy breathing and grunting on the radio sounds that are consistent with exertion, not silence. And we have an impact attitude that suggests an attempt to arrest the dive rather than a passive loss of control. That doesn't prove a trim failure, but it fits the behavior of one. One more detail is worth keeping in mind as we move forward. This particular airplane had been extensively modified. New avionics, a modern autopilot, a lot of time in the shop after purchase. 
Anytime you introduce new systems into an older airframe, especially systems that interact with trim, you introduce complexity. Complexity doesn't mean fault, but it does deserve careful attention. So the question becomes this, if a trim-related problem began during the climb, would the flight path we see make sense? And perhaps just as important, would a highly experienced pilot have had much time to respond? Those are the questions we'll pick up with next. Once the airplane began accelerating downhill, the situation would have changed very quickly. This is where looking at the raw numbers matters because airplanes don't behave emotionally, they behave aerodynamically. The data shows the aircraft accelerating well beyond normal cruise speed, reaching a point where control forces would have increased dramatically. The faster the airplane goes, the more authority the stabilizer has and the more force is required at the elevator to oppose it. This is not linear, it rises fast. So now ask a simple question, if the trim were neutral or even slightly nose up, would we expect to see this kind of acceleration paired with a steepening descent? Probably not. Power alone doesn't drive the nose down like this. Gravity doesn't either not without something actively holding the nose there. A nose down trim condition, however, would do exactly that. What's especially telling is that the descent wasn't perfectly smooth. It wasn't a clean vertical drop. The airplane continued transmitting ADS-B data as it descended, and the final moments show changes in pitch and bank. The right wing was low at impact, the nose angle had reduced from its steepest point. That suggests effort. If the airplane had simply departed controlled flight, or if the pilot were no longer involved, the path would likely look more uniform. Instead, what we see looks like someone trying to arrest the descent managing moments of partial recovery before being overwhelmed again. This is consistent with a pilot trying to overpower an out-of-trim airplane. Every small success, a slight pitch reduction, a wing correction would be temporary unless the trim itself were neutralized. Without that, the airplane would keep re-entering the dive. It's also worth noting that extreme airspeed works against recovery. As speed builds, pulling harder doesn't just become difficult, it becomes physically limiting. At some point, strength stops mattering. Geometry wins. From the outside, this can look chaotic. From inside the cockpit, it's brutally simple. The airplane wants to go down, and it won't stop trying. Let's circle back briefly to cargo, not to dismiss it, but to place it in context. Unsecured cargo is a serious issue. It always deserves attention, especially in smaller aircraft. But it's important to match cause to effect. A significant aft center of gravity shift typically makes an airplane more pitch sensitive and more prone to nose up tendencies. It doesn't naturally drive the nose steeply down. In fact, an aft CG often produces the opposite problem one, where the airplane struggles to lower the nose at all. This accident did not unfold that way. The airplane didn't balloon upward. It didn't enter a steep climb and stall. It accelerated rapidly into a dive. That profile is far more consistent with a forward pitching force than a rearward CG excursion. There's another point that often gets overlooked. The heaviest single item on board the generator was secured in the aft baggage compartment. The remaining cargo consisted of smaller boxed items placed on seats and footwells. While not ideal, that type of cargo is far less likely to produce a sudden large shift capable of overpowering pitch control in seconds. Could smaller items move? Yes. Could they contribute to distraction or marginal handling issues? Possibly. But would they drive the aircraft into a high-speed nose-down descent against a pilot's inputs? That's a much harder case to make. This is where the trim system explanation continues to align more closely with what we see. Trim doesn't care about intent training or cargo discipline. When it moves the stabilizer, the airplane follows until something stops it. That doesn't mean cargo played no role at all. It simply means that cargo alone does not cleanly explain this particular sequence. And in accident analysis, clean explanations matter. Right now, this remains a preliminary report. There are more questions than answers, but there are a few very specific things investigators will focus on as this case develops. One of the most critical pieces of evidence is the pitch trim actuator itself. If enough of the stabilizer system can be recovered, investigators may be able to determine the trim position at or near impact. That information can be extremely telling. A stabilizer set near full nose down would not prove causation on its own, but it would strongly support a trim-related event. They'll also be looking closely at maintenance records, especially surrounding the avionics and autopilot installation. Modern autopilots interface directly with trim systems, and while these systems are certified and tested, integration matters. Rigging calibration and redundancy checks all become relevant when dealing with a stabilizer-based trim design. Investigators will also consider the human factors side not in terms of blame, but capability. 
How much time would a pilot realistically have to diagnose and respond to this scenario? Were the procedures recent and reinforced? Were there any cockpit cues that might delay recognition by just a second or two? Because in events like this, seconds matter. Ultimately, this accident may come down to understanding how a unique system behaves at the edge of its envelope. Not how it works on paper, but how it feels when it turns against you without warning. That's why this case matters beyond a single flight. There are still B-100 flying, there are still pilots transitioning into unfamiliar variants, and there are still assumptions we carry from one airplane to another. This accident reminds us that airplanes with familiar names can behave in very unfamiliar ways. As the investigation continues, we'll learn more. And when we do, the goal won't be to point fingers, it will be to understand, so that the next pilot who finds themselves in a moment like this has just a little more knowledge and maybe a little more time. That's how safety moves forward. Thank you for watching.